welcome to uh, each event of conversation with Mr. Ebrahim Golestan as a part of the retrospective Golestan Film Studio, uh, of which the first feature length film, Break and Mirror, was played yesterday. And tomorrow we're going to show some of the shorts and documentaries. And I'm very pleased and honored to have Mr. Golestan with us in Bologna. But in fact, the history of Mr. Golestan in Italy dates back to the time these films were made. In fact, the very first country, or rather the very first festival, Venice Film Festival, which has screened these films, documentary films, uh, starting from a fire, was Venice Film Festival. So I was very surprised to learn from Mr. Golestan that a fire, wave coral, rock, and use of marlic were all premiered in Venice Film Festival. And of course, Break and Mirror was shown at Pizarro Film Festival in 1965, the year in which Pier Paolo Pasolini presented his famous paper on cinema of poetry. And the next year, Furu Farouksad, Mr. Golestan's collaborator, went there again for The House is Black. And uh, it also worth mentioning that the film uh, The House is Black won the major, the top prize at the Oberhausen Film Festival. So these films have been played in European film festivals and cinematheques some 50 years ago. And it's very, uh, it's a great pleasure for all of us to, to see them back on the screens. So uh, today, uh, my friend Mehna Saeed Bafa, an Iranian, Iranian-American from uh, teaching at the University of Chicago, is here with us. She has written about Mr. Gulistan at length. And uh, also, uh, she uh, had a key role in uh, organizing a similar retrospective in North America in Chicago almost 10 years ago. So Mehna is going to be with us today. and. Uh, I would suggest starting with a couple of questions and then opening the session to you. So feel free to ask any question you like about the film you saw yesterday or if you already know Mr. Golestan's filmography, other questions. And be prepared for tomorrow's really wonderful selection of documentary films. So Menas, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, my first question is from Mr. Kodasan. Uh, being a prominent writer uh, and, of course, a filmmaker, uh, would you please talk about the relationship of your literary work to your filmmaking? Is, do you see that the continuation of your cinematic work as your work in literature? Well, I was supposed to answer your questions, not to lecture on myself. So you put questions to me, I would answer. I cannot start by uh, talking about myself, really. Well, it's about you, sir, today. Sorry? It's about you today. Yes, it's about me, but will you, uh, ask me and I'll give you an answer. Okay, okay, let's put it this way. Uh, you did translations of some of the greatest writers in the history of literature, from Dostoevsky to Chekhov, <coughs> William Faulkner, Ernest Hemingway, and then you were a novelist yourself. And then you switched to filmmaking. But when I asked you this question some time before, you said it wasn't switching. It was a continuation of my literary work. So what do you mean by saying that your cinema is a continuation of your literary work? Well, because literary work is my work. Yeah. Cinema is my work. And my work is my work. <laughs> as, as simple as that. No, it's as simple as that, of course. Well, possibly if you had uh, eaten the food I make, uh, 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 kitchen work could have been a continuation of my work. Uh, fighting somebody, banging somebody in the head. Again, that sort of thing. Uh, life is just one unit. It has different aspects, all right? But uh, what, I just don't understand what do, we, what, what do you mean? What do you want me to say? Uh, yes. I had written stories, I had written articles, I had written essays, and then I bumped into filmmaking. 
and I was filmmaking, not uh, storytelling, but uh, kind of a museum kind of material, and that's uh, helped me a lot because I did not go through the motion of the stupid things they teach us various schools, put the camera this way, cut the cut the, that way. No, no, I just you live and learn by yourself. And therefore the whole thing becomes your own way of working and your own work. That's it. I just drifted into filmmaking and I made films. And I drifted out of filmmaking and I continued to write by myself. Thank you. But not many writers are able, keen, or have the potential to start a film production company, the very first independent film production studio in Iran, to produce their own work. So how was the beginning of that? Well, I wish there was a film studio capable of uh, housing me. There was none. And that's why I cared to make it. Not even, no, no building, no equipment, no collaborators. I had to start having a studio of my own, having the equipment of my own, not relying on the silly people who were doing their best to make money. And I had to have uh, uh, people to work for me. Uh, I had only a, a, a team of four or five persons, none of them ever having been involved in filmmaking, none of them ever having gone to any movie cinema or a movie school to learn. Uh, my, uh, well, somebody I knew who had been in jail because of his political, well, not ideas really, he was just wrongly, well, not wrongly, but he drifted into uh, thing, and he, he came out and he said, give me a job, and I gave him a job, and he was no good. He never stood with me. He didn't do anything. Uh, I remember he even translated very badly. Uh, he, well, it's a, forget about that. But one day he came to me and said, I saw yesterday somebody in the street, a, a worker, a, a builder, uh, not a builder, a, a, a menial worker, uh, who had been uh, in jail because he had been selling uh, to the party newspapers. He is now out of jail. And he's, he's an intelligent boy. Why don't you use him uh, for uh, some people who carry the heavy equipment for your team that go? And I said, all right. I, uh, he began as a uh, bricklayer, apprentice bricklayer. He came to me as a uh, bearer of heavy equipment. And he ended, ended up as being my cameraman for all the film I made. Well, I had to, to tell him how to do it, and he was very keen on doing it. And he was quite a useful person. How did you learn it yourself? Sorry? How did you learn it yourself, to work with the camera or sound? If, you have, if you are intelligent enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you learn. Okay. You learn. If you are not intelligent enough, you follow somebody. And following somebody, you end up with a copy of that somebody at, at the best. I, uh, well, I was very young, uh, just a, uh, even less than a teenager. I was 12 years old. 12 years old are not teenagers. You will start being teenager when you come to 13 years of life. All right. They bought me, my father bought me a camera, a, a, a box, a very cheap box camera, and I worked with that. And then I graduated myself into better cameras, and I took so good, so many good pictures. And in the very first uh, uh, competition of photography in Iran, I won the top prize. This was in 1920. <coughs> 19, no. 1945, yes, there was a, a competition of ph photographs organized by a, the Soviet, actually, the Soviet Union's cultural house in Tehran. 
And, but there were two very interesting, three interesting people, uh, very well educated yeah. people, Dr. George Johnny. Uh, well, the, the names are the, the, the important. Anyway, they organized that thing, and I made a, a series of contributions. And uh, four of my photographs were chosen for the display, and one of them was chosen as the top prize. That was how I was taking pictures. Uh, then uh, somebody was leaving the country and was selling his stuff, amongst which was a high Bolex 8 millimeter camera, movie camera, and I bought that. And it was at the time of the Mossad death, when the uh, oil company was the getting rid of this. Yes, anyway. And some television people, companies, in those days, very few of them, NBC in New York, wanted to have material and they uh, had got in touch with some people to find somebody to take pictures, and that somebody found me, and I began to make pictures for them. And this helped me, because I didn't go to a school. I was not told to put the camera on the tripod, or do this or do that. I just walked my way out, and I found what to do, how to do it. How was the best way of doing it? Let's Can you go back to like a part of the question, which is you know you have done a lot of writing in the uh, 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 and mirror. Um, can you please talk about the process of writing of brick and mirror? And if there was any kind of improv involved in that process? Well, writing is writing. You, uh, you go to a school, you learn alphabet, and you imagine and you think and you just uh, you see that what you are writing is bad, you try to make it better, and then, then you become a writer. But if you are uh, self-centered and stupid, and you say, well, oh, because I am writing, therefore it is the best way, then you are stuck. But I hope that I was not stuck. That's it. Uh, what, what else can I say? But was it, uh, as Menas uh, mentioned, uh, was it when you wrote the script for Break and Was there a script? I was there wrote a script for okay. anything. So what was the story? How it happened? How it was spelled? Well, you imagine. When, when, uh, when how, there's a screen. How did uh, uh, any big poet write his poetry? He didn't go to do certain sort of thing, he just imagined. He had done his job, he has done his training, his mind had been fertile. But, and you put it on paper eventually. Of course you do. And when you read it and you say that the, the, the verbs are badly placed, wrongly conjugated, then you s try to correct yourself. Some people don't want to correct themselves. They are too much damn stupid or too much concerned with their own self-ideas, and they continue writing badly. Some people don't want, like, are not like that, and they correct themselves. So when you work with those actors, did they have a, any role in terms of their dialogues or not? Sorry? When you work with those actors, especially in particular the cafe scene, uh, did they have uh, any role in uh, uh, their lines, or you scripted all the lines for them? Of course they had. They had no right to, to say what they want to say. It was my film. I was making the so film. So you had written it. Everything was written. Well, the, the only thing I was writing for all of my films uh, was the, the dialogue, the conversation between, uh, but no low angle, high angle, travel, uh, none, of, none of these things. You just wrote the... the the, uh, the dialogue, you make them memorize the dialogue and deliver it very according to your own taste. And when that was done, then you took it to the stage for, for making it. And then whatever was there, you used as a kind of a backdrop or as a kind of a road to walk from here to there, go up the steps, come down the steps, or whatever. Well, the, 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 you knew what a story you wanted to say. You, you, just, you just kept your freedom for yourself. Uh, freedom to work on the, spot, on the spot. You were not a slave of somebody who was financing the, the film. You were not a, a slave of your own idea. Uh, in the middle of making the film, if you had to 
yeah, it's coming across it. A better idea, you let the better idea come in. You may have been wrong, you may have been making a mistake, but it was you who were responsible. You were trying to evaluate, weigh things up, and store it. What I am trying to say is that whatever you read and you learn at a school, it's when, if, 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 if you read physics, if you read chemistry, if you are reading medicine, you are reading the distillation of the work of others. But if you want to follow that, to limit yourself with that, it's no good. You are not developing. You've got to develop yourself. Well, if you develop yourself, you, you just come across things that I have not done before. Well, uh, I don't know whether, well, for example, the film that you may have seen last night, and I'm sorry, in fact, you had seen it. It was not a full version of my film. It was uh, played with uh, under the circumstances. Things were not there, and they had put them together the way they wanted it to be. And anyway, this was not the whole thing. It was not uh, my final product. But anyway, you, will, you, will, you have seen films in cinema. There are actors talking to the camera, and the film is being made. And the man is driving. He never looked at the road ahead. He just talked to the actors who sit there. But then, how come that when he is looking at the girl beside him or the man beside him, he doesn't hit the wall? It just goes on. That's that. You, you, you see that, and you try, when you are making a film of two people running a, a car, driving in a car, they should look at the road and talk while well, well, not looking at each other, look at the road. This apparently had not been taught to anybody in the cinema schools. And invariably in films you see that people are talking to each other while driving and the car does not end up in an accident. Well, that's what that's what I wish they had. But because they are not driving in a car, for the ease of operation, they have made a mock-up of a car in the studio. And with the back projection, they show the car is running. It's not running. They are in a, in a, sitting in a, just like this, like back like, again. Yeah. And the film is made, and the, the, you think that it's, they are driving. But they what are, did you do in Breaking Mirror to avoid that cliche of using yes, back projection? I put, I put the camera, fixed the camera on the bonnet of the car. And that's why, you see, when you see the film, when the car is running through the street, the lights pass one by one reflection in the mirror. You don't see that in the film. Or, for example, there are people are talking. Uh, a, 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 a very famous filmmaker who had come to Tehran to make films, he had come to my studio to hire a, uh, some, some equipment. What's and his he, name? Well, forget about it. <laughs> He's dead, I suppose. Well, he was dead anyway, right away. Uh, and anyway, he, he said, no, no, I, I object to that. That, that. These two are talking to each other, walking, and one is this direction, the other is that direction. Yes, that was me. I will that. Because the camera is looking at this man from this point of view, and the camera is looking at this one from that point of view, and therefore, obviously, the direction visually is changed. Although you are going to the same place, but incidentally, in the film, while the sequence is going on, these two people are not going to the same direction. They are separating from each other. Well, these are the things that you have to, tell, to take care of. I, I did take care of. I, I, I possibly realize that this should be it. And uh, one, of, one, of your, uh, one of the people at the uh, Gulistan Film Studio who was trained by you and was sent for education... We were four or five of us. I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm speaking of uh, four or five of us. We were sent to learn editing well, in England. Well, was like, no, no. No. <laughs> no? No, it's not true. She never studied in England a, a no, course on editing. No, no, of course not. Yeah. No. So what, what, what can you 
two, two months editing in Yeni Plan, you learn how to edit? Just to learn the machine. No, 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 no. no, no. We had no machine. Yeah. The fire, which we'll see, you will see. Perhaps yeah. you will see tomorrow if the fate of that fire, that film, is not like the fate of the other film that you saw last night. Uh, well, uh, the editing of that film, you may laugh at me or you may cry over that. It was done with the hand driven editing table. Hand driven. When, when you are driving the film through the editing machine with the hand, you are not in control of the speed of the shot. But to compensate for that, we were editing that film with that sort of machine. And once a certain amount of film was ready, then we put it into 16, it was a 16 millimeter figure. We put it into 16 millimeter projector to see whether it works. It works, okay, we keep it that way. That, we edited that film that way. The same with my first film, uh, from a drop to the sea. The first, oh, it's, it's, it's just like that. Yeah. You do not follow. We were not waiting for the film to be transferred onto 35 millimeter film and bring in the machine of 35 millimeter. This is how it was. She, she worked on that one. She was not an ordinary girl. She was an intelligent girl, as her poetry shows. All right? And this one, she learned very quickly. Very, at the same time, she also, for the very first time, acted on the stage in a very, very difficult play. And it was amazing. The, the, the play was written by an Italian. Anyway. Pirandello. Sorry? Pirandello. Yes, Pirandello, yes. Six persons in search of a character. Oh, yes. But if you are intelligent, you can up to a certain point progress. And your progress depends upon the level of understanding of your area. Yes. Well, the films we produced was, was, was superior to the, the, the ones produced in the area, and therefore we were being shout at and written articles against. No, no, it's all right. It's all right. <coughs> but the films went outside, the first one that got ever prized by an international respectable. In those days, festivals were very, very respectable. There were only two or three festivals. Nowadays, in every village, you have a festival. <laughs> well, it's all right. It's all right. Perfect. But anyway, the very first time a Persian film was winning a prize was a fire at Venice. And he won, it won the very top prize. There is a golden statue of Mercury Do. That's how it was. The second one, the, which is not shown tomorrow, um, uh, Wave, Coral and Rock, it won again a, a prize at Venice. The third one, the film she made on Labour colony. For Labour colony was entirely, entirely her work. The camera work, everything, everything was hers. Who's who is her, sir? The director of the film. For of course. Yes. What do you mean? You, 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 you just want to make sure that I understand. Oh, you, whether you are not sure or not sure, that's the fact. <laughs> I was there at all, but she had learned. By practice, not by me. I, I was not a great teacher. Anyway, she was intelligent. She learned. She was intelligent, she learned. Yeah. Well, you have gone to a movie see the, the studio or a school. Perhaps you have learned better, or you have not learned at all, or your teacher has been stupid. Well, therefore, you will not come out as a brilliant person. And it's also the question of the choice of the subject. We made four or five films. One about the fire. One about how an island is turned into a very large old terminal and the change of society. One about discovery of ancient artworks. Yes, it is about that, but it is about something totally different. All of these films, one about lepers, so very much different. 
But in you look, you, we, we picked up the uh, film Leper Colony, <coughs> without me, uh, just because I wanted to show that our society is a closed-in society, bad, sick society. And we, at, at the very beginning of that film, I wrote that. The, the world has done a lot of bad things, but it can be bettered. It can be improved. Well, this is it. You got to see it. You got to see it face to face, and try to remedy it. Well, one of the way of remedying it was just to do that, that film. When we were making that film, the money for that film, the the, the runners of the Leprosario said they did not have money to do that. What well, they had, but spending money on a film, very dicey. I said, oh, okay. I, I, I financed part of the film, they financed another part of the, four of them. But the film, in the very first run, was so much bombarded with donations for the liver colony. The whole thing changed. The whole of that liver colony changed. Everything about that changed. This is what you have to do. But if I had said, ah, oh, forget it, who oh, are what, what do I care? I had seen that that liver colony is an example of our own society. And it's got to be remedied. So I said, Let, let's go ahead and make a film. And I told her, you go ahead and you, film, you make this film on this context. And she did. She did. When she brought back the rashes, I, when I was looking at the rashes, it was totally different from the things that was usually brought up by. Or, anyway, that's all. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, the film that Mr. Gurusan is talking about, The House is Black, is being, going to be played tomorrow. Uh, I do not know why and how that uh, copy has survived. The copy that was sh shown last night of Brick and Mirror had not survived anything, despite the fact that it is called restored, when well, it was not restored. Well, it was restored, possibly, but I saw the, uh, the beginning of the film, it made me go out of the uh, thing. Uh, there are places when the pictures were missing, and they had put black parts. I know, it's all right. Okay, it's okay. okay. let's move on. So, uh, uh, speaking of ugliness, when you made Break and Bear, it was shown in 64 in Europe. In 65, you hired a cinema for two weeks. 66. It was 66. Yes, to, to screen yes. the film. And the most vicious pieces of so called film criticism that oh, I've ever heard. Why? Why about. suddenly everybody decided to hate you? Because I'm a hateful person. You don't look like a hateful person. Well, they thought I am. Why should they think you're well, hateful? Understand? They're dead. Better. Good. <laughs> okay. You no, know, no. The, the, the vicious people, uh, jealous people, are always around. Are always around. You may be. Uh, your mother may be vicious. Your father may be jealous of you. It's, it's all right. I mean, this these sorts of thing happens. This is human nature, and this is the human nature that counteracts the human achievements. Well, I'm not going to detail of. Can I ask you a question, Eric? Are you a major film? Did you have any problem with censorship? Whether what? It with censorship? censorship? Whether it was a, a break your You child? lived in censorship all the time. You had to fool them. Yes, of course. Well, the film that you are not going to see tomorrow night, uh, I, I made the film 10 years before the Persian the Iranian Revolution. And he did every single detail of this time. All the stupid things that they were doing is there. And I had to just cover myself up as viciously and wickedly as possible to make the film possible. No, don't bring in my wickedness, my vicious, quirky kind of a mind into the distribution of my films. I had to do that. Well, He's just mentioned that for Brick and Mirror, I hired, this was, 
advised to me by a man who is now the greatest, the most rich man in England, an Indian. That Indian um, Hindu job, he was a very nice person. He, he is, his uh, fortune is over thousands of millions of pounds now. He was an Indian who was uh, doing uh, customs work at Zahedan, he had come to Tehran, he had brought in Indian films, he had made Indian film working in Tehran. Uh, whatever. He said, you cannot, they don't show this thing. That my better advice to you is to let me hire on your behalf a movie home and we pay something. If the film works, then your money is not gone. You get back your money, which I did, actually. We, we, we hired a cinema, the best cinema in Tehran, for two weeks. Uh, and in those two weeks, the money that I had paid for renting the hall came back to me. Uh, well, well, slightly, I just don't remember now, a little bit less or a little bit more. I, I don't think it's, it's a long time ago. And all of these things, when our past, when are gone, they're gone. I mean, you just do not get yourself involved with the memory of these things. Anyway, that's how it was. Am I talking to an English-speaking audience? A mix, I would say. Is that right? Mix? Ira are there Iranians here? Okay, so there are some Iranians, there are well, Italians, they're very international. Well, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, but they're, they're translating from up there, so they're, they're, they have earphones and they're listening to oh. simultaneous translation. Okay. No, no, I'm sorry. Okay, so uh, let's uh, 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 see if there are, oh, there are questions. Okay, so would you pass the mic, please? I am uh, from Italy, but uh, I try to speak in English. <laughs> Uh, I have seen yesterday for the first time. Uh, I have seen yesterday for the first time your feature. I only knew a fire before and uh, the that film. Uh, so I was sure that uh, this uh, retrospective would be something of uh, extreme importance, but never that. Surprised yesterday that uh, so extraordinary, extraordinary and beautiful film was not uh, perceived enough until today as one of uh, the masterpieces of the 60s. Yeah. So uh, when I hear from the director that uh, this work wasn't uh, the right version, I am very curious uh, to know what's uh, missing in it because I, I must uh, tell you that uh, it's uh, anyway a great film. Uh, I, I think it, uh, it will uh, remain one of the greatest films I, I'll see this year of all periods and of all countries. Can so, I say what you yes. Say? Okay. I'm, okay. میگم که فقط فیلم خشت و آینه فقط فیلم آتش و خانه سیاه هست آقا دیده بودن ولی دیروز خیلی فیلم خشت و آینه روشون تاثیر گذاشته و اینکه شما میدید خشت و آینه نسخه ای که مورد نظر شما بوده نیست چه همینی که هست خیلی براشون موجز آسا بوده ولی چه چیزی چه چه چیزای کمه که باعث میشه شما بگید که این فیلمی که دیدن کامل است there are three sequences in that film it's very very sad and very strange the film was deposited with French Cinematheque, which was the very first Cinematheque ever. And it was run by a very great man, Henri Longlois. Henri Longlois was dead at 10, 10, 15 years, no, 12 years. After I had deposited the film at Cinematheque, I went to the Cinematheque, uh, and they told me there had been a fire in Ansaldi. A fire and some of the films were destroyed. I don't know whether it was right or wrong. Anyway, then they said there are only two pictures removed. And I wanted to see them. One was this. And I saw that three scenes 
are three very important scenes to me, for which I, except especially for one of them, I had spent a lot of money for that one scene. They were missing. Why they were missing? Because these three scenes were every one of them about over a minute long, and people in the film were not talking. They were just walking or staying there. And somebody in the cinematic said that it's a waste of time when people are not talking. People should talk. And they had cut that part out. So, and, I, and, I, and after the Iranian revolution, I had no access to my films in Tehran. I was outside. And for no price or anything, I would have gone back to Tehran to find things. But fortunately, a lady who is in charge of uh, film in Iran, Khanum a great lady, as, as much as I am concerned, I, I asked her whether could I borrow your film for just one day. And I borrowed the film she had brought with her to Paris. And it, this is, they are different from people, people who help complete the films and people who reuse the films. Anyway, she gave me that film and those scenes I immediately, for one in one day, I got it duplicated and printed and I asked the cinematic themselves and I went to their own offices and I inserted those two scenes. Now, those two scenes were not apparently or three scenes in the film in Chicago that you saw last night. I had sent those two scenes to them. Uh, and I had understood that they have uh, inserted them. But last night, they told me they, it is not they are not innocent, but they are at the end of the film. They have put that in. I just do not know. I, I didn't want even to see that. Uh, and when I saw at the beginning of the film frames of film missing and black things inserted, I just walked on. I didn't want to see the rest of it. But this is it. But the whole story is not, yes, the feeling, the feeling would be changed if those three scenes are not there. And if they are misplaced at the end. You, you, you see, I, it, it, there is no explanation really. Uh, 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 Silly to compare to compare with anything. It just uh, in the film you see somebody dying, and after half an hour or two hours, you show the audience why he died. At the end, the film is finished, but then you see uh, he is or she is drinking poison or being shot at. It's really you have serious anyway. Okay, but uh, uh, as. Uh the scenes that Mr. Golisan mentioned, only one was not in the film which was played. So the most crucial scene missing from the print Mr. Golisan had seen was the shot in the orphanage when the camera is tracking back which was in the film. So the one which was played was in the market at night as the clip on the back. So next question. Uh, here, uh, the microphone here. Oh, there's one question there and then uh, in English or Italian? Uh, preferably English, okay. unless someone translates it. Okay. Um, I watched the movie yesterday, I really did enjoy it. And, um, but you, before you talk about society, and um, I don't know anything from uh, Iran in the 60s, and uh, I want to know if the, how the film is connected to what's happening in society at that time. For example, the, the main character is a, is a paranoid is a, or obsessed by someone else who spying him or uh, checking him. I want to know if, for example, this is uh, something that happening in the country and how the film is okay. related to society. Uh, uh, و ولی با تماشای این فیلم برای من جالب بود که ارتباط فیلم با جامعه ایران رو باور پیدا کنم به خصوص توی مضمون پارانویایی که این ترس که توی توی فیلم موج میزنه این چه ارتباطی با جامعه ایران اون موقع داره برای کسی که نمیدونه در ایران در 1960 چه خبر بود چیکار کنم چیکار کنم وات دو اسی اوکی ول ایت یو هاف 
understood the paranoia that it is in the field, well, that there was a paranoia in the field, in, in the society. There is this paranoia in the society everywhere, everywhere. I am sure there is a certain amount of paranoia now in England after this referendum. It, it is a paranoia. The, 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 the government of the country is trying to go back again into a second referendum to an I. It is it. The society is in turmoil all over the world. We are living through a lot of problems. We are used to it, to them. We don't comprehend it. But America. In America, you, you can see in the news that they, are, they, are, they may be electing somebody uh, as a president of the republic with his finger on the atomic bomb. And you don't know what happened in the world. And somebody, a shopkeeper in a back alley of a village in America, is thinking of his future, his money, and, and he works for him. And uh, they have voted for the same sort of person as senators in the past. Uh, uh, McCain was a uh, become the, the leader of the uh, Republicans in America, and he was against everything. Uh, they they bring in their own personal things, and they interpret those things as social motivation, as social problems. And then we suffer for a bit. Uh, it is very, actually, I think the question is how do I connect the paranoia with the paranoia existing in the field? I think the question is really, uh, in a way, I'm sorry, absurd. The paranoia is there. The, uh, the, the recognition of the paranoia is the thing that we have to do and to avoid, uh, to remedy the paranoia. Yes, the paranoia is always there. Can we have the microphone here? Yes, sir. Yes, um, I have a, there's a, a certain problem, or at least I have an understanding about. We spoke earlier about translation. When you were saying that you were opposed to having any of your, your, novel, your novels or stories translated into English because the form of the writing was so basic to the meaning. But at the same time, you've translated many of the greatest works of American literature, such as Huckleberry Finn, Faulkner, Hemingway, and so on. And I'm just trying to understand how you see this contradiction, or is it a contradiction? No, there is not. No. Uh, I have been against the translation of my own stories because I appreciate the way I wrote them. What they want to translate is to translate the story I have told. But the way I have told the stories and the way the, the sentences that convey my story to you would be changed. I, I, lots of times I have seen this. They, they, they read and they retell the story. I do not want to read. To, you, you, you saw the field as I have photographed it. Yes. And it cannot be changed. Of course, it, it, it was changed in a, a, a certain degree on the copy of last time. But Usually, it is the, the thing that I have made. That cannot be changed much. But the sentence is changed. The rhythm is changed. The emphasis, where, 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 which part of the sentence you want to put the emphasis, this changes. Uh, I have no, but then why didn't did you translate all of these uh, works of American literature where the same problem exists? Why have I translated? When you translated Huckleberry Finn, it's the same problem, isn't it? No, 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 not the way it is. But, but, but I am telling that my audience, the, the one who are going to read my translation, yes. that this is their story. They have to go back and... Uh, but but in, in Europe, I cannot tell them something in English and ask them to go back to my own original Persian, because the Persian language is not so much commercially spread. Yes, I see. That, that's a, the problem. But uh, I have to answer the Hemingway. Yes. Hemingway, the impact of Hemingway is on two things. First, the shortness, the compactness of the sentences and the way it is. And then the, the 
feeling of the people in the story. Uh, I can in, in the killer, in the story of the killer, yes. when they go to find the man who is Old Anderson, they find Old Anderson, who is to be killed by the killers, who is as, and they go, they find him in a room. He has turned his back to the wall, or he looks at the wall, and he knows that they are after him. And the kind of uh, ready for danger, ready for the fate, is it there. This is to be said the way he has said it. Or the sentence at the end of the favorite walks. I went back to the hotel in the rain. This, if, if you say, ah, I was very unhappy, ah, the rain was falling, ah, 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 this is bad. It should be said that in that compactness. If it is not said with that terse, I went back to the hotel in the rain, it will not be heavy rain. If old Anderson is described in a different way, it will not be. It will be different. Way. I am trying to preserve my, the integrity of my own story, the way I have made it. There are few readers in Persian, very few readers in Persian. But a book in English of so many. Let them read the story of McPhil. <coughs> Let them read the story of Hemingway in my translation. And then if they like it, if they are after understanding, sensing the good literature, then they should take well the same in, 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 in if, if if they are really willing to understand Chayon, they better come out of Edward, Edward Fitzgerald's translation. It's a wonderful translation, but it is not accurate translation. Yes. This is it. The accuracy of Chayon is lost. There's something else. You, you cannot have half his دوش دیدم که ملا یک در می خانه زدن گل آدم بسرش کرد و به پیمان زد Last night I saw the angels knocking at the door of the tavern and coming down to mix the clay with the wine to produce the first human being Well, this is, this is it But the way it is said and the description is problematic for anybody even for Iranians who do not understand Iranian well enough, who do not go into the meaning, the back of it is. Well, it seems like the only way that, American, that people who are English speakers can ever appreciate your stories is if you translate themselves, like translate them yourselves into English, like Beckett did, which might mean rewriting them. But uh, at least we would have been have a, a clue. I think my job when I was making those stories, yes. it was finished when I made those stories. And I never thought of any reader of my stories. Even the film, believe me, John, the film, the film, the Rick and Miller, really, I was addressing myself. That is the way to be honest with you, yourself. You do not talk to others because you do not know how the others understand, how others are feeling. You are the criterion of your own ideas. You say it for yourself, and when you are satisfied, it's all right. If you are not satisfied, well, you are fooling them. You are fooling the audience. I just do not want to fool the audience. I really, in every single part of the films I have made, I have addressing myself. This, this was the only way of being sincere to yourself. That's all the only. If you know of any other way, tell me. Of course, I have no time to repeat myself. I am 95 years old, and there is not much life left for me. Well, all right. But it's, it's all right. There is no other way. There is no, no, no better way, no, no other way to do it honestly, sincerely. Uh, but we have time for one last question. Any questions? One last question. I'm glad it is done. Okay. Can I ask one or you're tired? Sorry? Can I ask a question or you're yes, tired? Yes, of course. Okay. Uh, this is not in chronological order, but 
Do you remember the very first film you ever saw in your life? Do you remember the very first film you ever saw in your life? Yes. What is that? Well, it was a film, I haven't, I, have, I do not remember the whole of it, but it was a film by Foyad. The, Barabbas. Sorry? Barabbas. Barabbas, yes, I told you that, yes. Barabbas. Yes, that was the very first thing. And I saw, and the very first thing I was happy with seeing and loved was the Chaplin film, one of those two reelers. Not it. Yes. Yes. Then, yeah, I went to cinema uh, the first time when the city, the cinema was brought to our city a long time before I was born. I was born in 1922. But before that, in 1918, 17, 15, there was a cinema only for uh, the, uh, the British soldiers, who are mostly Indians, who were part of the uh, SPR, South Persian Rifles. They had come to the south of Iran. Well, anyway, the cinema was for them. But popular cinema, public cinema for everybody, was brought in, in 1928, I suppose. And uh, I was taking the film. The very first picture I saw on the screen was a museum of the Reza Shah, the, the king, who had just become king in four or five years before that. There was a film of him walking. You know, that this was the, the museum of the film. And then afterward, that film by Fouillard. Yes. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure talking to you, Mr. Gurustan. So I, I didn't even talk to you. You made me talk to others. Well, <laughs> they are here for you, not for oh, me. Thank you. So uh, please put your hands together for Mr. Ebrahim Gurustan. <laughs>